This is Farah, the podcast host of In Conversation, the podcast of Banyan Books and Sound. And I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Swami Lalita Nanda. She's the president of the Yashodara Ashram in the Kootenays of British Columbia. A sannyasi or a Swami since 1996 and a longtime student of yoga, she brings an intuitive and innovative approach to her teaching. She's also author of The Inner Life of the Asanas and The Hidden Language of Hatha Yoga, and we're here to speak about light and sound as it relates to the practice of yoga. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Namaste. So I'd like to start by asking, you know, most people when they think about yoga, they think of the physical postures. How is light and sound connected to the practice of yoga? Well, it really does de depend on how you define yoga. But if you think of the um, actual meaning of yoga, which is tonight to unite. Um, so you have to unite with something. And my teacher, Swami Radha, said that the purpose of yoga is to unite our individual consciousness with cosmic consciousness. So that's a pretty big order. And um, one way to enter is through the asanas because we have bodies. So bodies are part of our experience. And, um, but what are our bodies? So it's to ask the questions. And a lot of what my, um, this style of yoga that I'm involved in, Yashodara Yoga that Swami Radha developed is about asking the questions. So what really is our body and what is our body made of? And what happens when we bring awareness into the body? What happens when we bring the breath in, when we lengthen the spine, when we soften the face and relax the shoulders, all of those great things that we do in yoga. So it's that bringing in of awareness. And um, if we slow down enough, we start to observe our breath. And so our breath is our life force. And, and we can imagine that life force carrying light within it. So light then penetrates the body and permeates the body. And where else would light reside? Could it, could it reside in my brain, in my mind, in my heart, in that place of love? So it's to unite all of these things together. It's not to say that asana isn't yoga or only, um, you know, bhakti, the heart part is yoga, or only yanana, the mind part is yoga. There are different aspects that lead us to the same place of, uh, of receptivity to a greater power that we can all access. And what about sound? How is sound a part of accessing light in ourselves? Well, again, it's, um, it's subtle because sound is vibration and everything that has life has a vibration. Um, in our tradition and in many traditions of yoga and practice, um, we use a mantra, we use mantras, which are sacred sounds. So because we're human, um, we speak, we, we use words, um, we use our breath to create sound that when the air comes in, vibrates against our vocal cords. And if we can, if we, we can have sort of garden variety sounds or we can have like mad sounds or negative sounds or very positive, joyful sounds. But if we, um, if we can come to a calm place, then our sound will create a vibration around us that's different from ordinary sounds, a sound that can elevate us. So the word mantra means the sound that liberates and protects. So we have a number of mantras that we use to, um, to calm the mind, to channel the emotions, to concentrate, to express devotion, to express our emotions, actually the full range of emotions, but in the sense of lifting them up. So sound is a power and any power can be directed in different ways. So the highest power is to direct it to the divine. And we can do that through mantra. 
And is um, our mantras practiced in Sanskrit or English or both? Um, well, mantra is a Sanskrit word, and our mantras that we do here are mainly in Sanskrit. Um, but we do acknowledge that mantra can be in other traditions as well. Um, we sometimes sing Most Beautiful Mother to, uh, to Mary, for example. And that, um, that loving devotional practice in English can also be very effective. And, you know, you've, you've practiced for, you're a long time student and teacher. Can you tell us a little bit about the different stages and relationships that we have with our practice and some of the um, obstacles or challenges that might arise for a long time student in staying dedicated and persevering until we reach and are able to enter and find that light within? Yeah, there's the formal practice, um, and then there's life as practice. And I think that that we can't that the aim is to bring our practice into our life, rather than oh, I've got a great practice, and then I go out and live my life, and it's not connected. So, um, so to be able to bring a mantra in in a situation that might be challenging is um, then you know that your practice is working for you. And so it's not that your practice has to advance and get longer and longer and better and better. I think that everybody goes through waves. And um, so part of it's a discipline and some people are more disciplined, some people are less disciplined. Some people can express their love completely in one moment and some people might need hours to reach that same stage. So there's, there's not really a judgment or a, um, a defined competitive range of how to do a practice. I think it's a lot to do with sincerity and, uh, and desire to, to offer something back to the world. So the other practice that's very important for us here at this ashram, at Yashodra Ashram, is karma yoga. And that's the yoga of action. So that's every day, every day doing action. Whatever our work is, whatever our day is, can we do that with awareness? And that's where the rubber hits the road, really. That's, that's where you know, <laughs> or you find out about yourself. So I know here we've just gone through um, a program where people come and stay for three months in residence and they're doing practice in the morning. They're doing their Hatha practice in the morning. They're in class all day, reflecting self-study, um, many different ways in. And then in the evening, they come here to the Temple of Light and, um, and we do satsang together, chanting. And they may have their personal practice and they may have homework three months, uh, very steady. But at the end of it, many people stay on and they do karma yoga. And they're surprised that even with, and they were an amazing, wonderful group, but even with all of that practice, the real, the real place is how are you in your life? And so that's the real practice to me. And so for yoga students who might spend time in an ashram or might uh, go to a class, it's really how it's how that whatever consciousness we experience or state we experience in that class, how it's integrated in, in our everyday activities and our everyday interactions and relationships. It is. Yeah, that's important. Living the practice. Yeah. I'm so curious to hear um, from a personal perspective what it was like when the, um, I know that there was a fire that destroyed the original Temple of Light and I'd love to hear a little bit about the personal process of, of uh, accepting that and then taking on the project of building a new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, it was so startling and so unexpected. And 
I was one of the first people to see the smoke and couldn't believe that it was from the temple. Um, the temple was, we have many buildings here, but the temple is dedicated to spiritual practice. And so, um, so it was quite heartbreaking for, for me and for everyone in our community when the temple burned. But it's similar to a death. When you have a death, um, there's so many things that you have to do right away. You have to deal with the fire. So we were, we called our volunteer fire department and we were helping them. And then we were up all night watching the fire. And then in the morning, we had to communicate what had happened to so many people who cared about this place. So there was just telling people and, and um, letting people know and then assessing the damage. And, and over time, coming to the conclusion that the temple had been so damaged that it, it wasn't repairable. And then thinking about, well, would we build it exactly the same or would we change it? And if we changed it, how would we know what to change it to? So all of that was a process. And um, I remember someone coming out and talking to me about it. And they said, well, do you see it as an opportunity? <laughs> and I got to say at the time, no, not really. Um, it was more like a devastation than the feeling of opportunity. And yet it was both. It was like something else is opening. So what is it? And because of what the temple represents, we all, all of the community decided we have to rebuild. And um, because it is a, it's a symbol for us, it, it's like a symbol of the heart of the ashram. And it's a symbol to the world that no matter what your religion or what your tradition, you're welcome here, you can enter this place. So it has, it has eight doors and they represent different ways of coming in to the center. And the center is the place where we all meet above or beyond or transcend the doctrines or dogmas or labels that we put on the divine, however we, however we say that. So in the very center of the temple up there, there's a skylight and um, that represents the divine light coming down to join us together. So we knew we were going to rebuild and um, and we found our architects because they seem to be people who could do very creative, interesting, curved things. And most buildings are square or rectangular, and not so much curved and wavy. And we had a feeling that our next temple, even though we loved our first temple and it was a beautiful dome, that our next temple needed to almost be spirally and almost have a feeling of movement and that we wanted to reach out to the world as well as go inward. So we have these beautiful, huge windows everywhere. And, and the temple did become an opportunity. It did become that. It was like a way of saying, okay, we're on a next phase. Where is the world now and what do we have to offer? And how can we come from a place of the inner strength that we've built over all these years because there's many of us who have been at the ashram for 20 to 30 years. So there's a very strong trust and a very strong foundation. And, um, and from that, we felt like we can maintain the essence of what the temple originally was. And at the same time, make it even more beautiful. And that's what happened. I'm going to um, take a moment to ask the question again. And there's a funny sound in the background. Do you know what that's coming from? Oh, what kind of sound is it? It's like a, um, I'm not sure. It's like a reverberation of some sort. I, I don't hear it now. But the other thing that was happening, I didn't want to interrupt you, is that I can see when it, it's picking up sound from me and when it transfers to pick up sound from you. So I'm going to ask just in case it didn't capture all of your answer. I'm just going to ask the question again. Okay. And um, make it shorter. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like to 
I know that there was a fire in the temple and what was it like to witness that and and what was it like to to see that as an opportunity to build something new it's interesting because I'm sitting in the new temple and um, and having memories of the old temple and of the evening when it burned and it was it was shattering for us it was heartbreaking for us to see this happening um, it was devastating in the moment and it, it it also demanded something of us so from from the demand of the old temple burning we um, we realized that we could build again and that we needed to build again, that the temple was part of Swami Radha's vision. It was also our vision now. How did we together as a group create something that had been, she had brought into being through her power of practice to bring something from a vision to become realized in tangible. And um, so we had her as a model. And um, so we just kept moving forward from one stage to the next. We, um, we, we cleared out the old temple. We um, found the architects that, that seemed to be able to understand what we were asking for. Um, we built a temporary temple for, that we, we kept up for two years until our other temple was, was, was ready. And then for uh, four years, we, we created the new temple. And um, telling the story of the temple to people, I think because Notre Dame just burned, I think you can understand the heartfelt connection that the French people have and really internationally, people have towards a building so there, there was that sense on a smaller scale with our first temple. And um, so building this new one, it was like entering a new phase for the ashram, a phase where the whole group of us came together to hold the vision and to, to um, create this space where we wanted to welcome people of all paths and all spiritual traditions. We wanted to keep that vision of that there can be a place of sanctuary and peace in the world. We wanted to hold that. And even if not very many people in the whole world know about us, it's not like a temple that everyone is going to come to. Still, the symbol of it resonates with many, many people. And, um, and the, the manifestation of this temple holds the same elements it has the eight entryways the central skylight the beautiful open view outward and the feeling of entering inward when you come into it so it holds the old and presents something for the world as it is right now tell me a little bit about the the process of the core group who's lived at the ashram for so long what was it like to crystallize and define and figure out a way to move forward and what the elements of the new would be like? Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing in our group was to recognize um, the loss. We had to acknowledge that loss and come together as a group and acknowledge it to ourselves and to the, our outer circles of people who care about the temple as well. And then we invited in people to help in whatever way they could. And it was such a feeling of support. We really felt all of, all of the devotees everywhere supporting us. Um, so there, there was a feeling of, of vulnerability, but also of strength. And, um, and then the demands of the time to, um, to move on. So we call it deconstructing the original temple it was um, a process. It's like the Shiva element you have to, was created eventually is destroyed. And so we had to go through that, see that power. And then there's this clarity of just the platform because the new temple is built on the very same foundation as the original. And so when we came back to the platform, we were surprised that, um, that there was this beautiful open feeling 
we're just like outside overlooking the lake and it was back to the original this was what it was like before the first temple was built and many of us had seen that so even though we thought we would be heartbroken at each stage we weren't it was like a recognition we've been here before and then we put up that when we did the temporary temple, it was again, oh, this seems so familiar. And um, there was a lot of uh, unity. If anything, this rebuilding of the new temple really brought us together. Um, we had a, a temple hub we called ourselves. Uh, it was a group of usually four people who communicated with the architects. And this is Paco Architects in Vancouver. Um, they're, amazing award-winning architects and we didn't know why they were interested in our project because it was so small compared to what they usually do but they they liked it because they thought a place of light a pure space this was like an architect's dream so it was a lovely match and um and we just kept talking and creating and finding the people who had worked for us and and then they started building it and we found that uh, right across the lake from us, there's, um, there's a place that's kind of world famous for making these prefabricated forms using CNC machines that cut precisely. So it was all prefabricated and then brought over and put together in pieces and stacked up till it became the temple. Did you feel in the process um, the presence of Swami Radha? Yeah, we called on her. We, we asked her to be here and to bless us. And um, because it was different from her original vision, slightly different, we wanted to make sure that we had that blessing for sure. And uh, because it went so smoothly, it really felt like she was, she was behind it. Is there uh, anything you'd like to say as an invitation to people who may never have visited the Temple of Light? Well, we would love for you to come. Um, there's different ways of coming. You can just come and just drop in and see the temple. It's open. Um, you can come for a day visit and have a Hatha yoga class, stay for lunch, have a tour of the ashram grounds and visit the temple. Or you can come for a retreat or course, and that way you you get to um, you get to experience the deeper part um, of our teachings. So that then I think the appreciation for the temple deepens because the practices mean more to you when you understand the sound and the light in the temple of light. Yeah. So yeah, we're open year round. You can come for a tiny drop in or you can stay for three months or you can come for Karma Yoga, which is a one month program. And that's a, that's a way to be in the temple every evening and to, uh, to put your yoga into action every day. It's been so lovely to hear a little bit about the a little bit about the practices and especially about the building of the Temple of Light and uh, really appreciate all that you've shared in the process about what that was like. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Is there any, um, now that it's complete, are there any future visions or aspirations? Um, we're playing it somewhat organically. So we're on the east shore of Kootenai Lake. It's a very um, rural community. And we've actually held a few cultural events here. Um, we had some young dancers come and they were beautiful and light and they just seemed to fit into the temple, lovely. And um, a few musical performances. So something that really seems to suit the ambience of the temple. We've also had um, memorial services um, here in the temple. And yeah, we like to be open to our community, our surrounding community, to know that the temple is there for them as well as for, for our ashram community. And um, I think over the years, it will tell us what it needs. 
we have to just listen. I suppose that's a, a big part of the intuition that was described in, in describing your approach is being open to what, what's being asked or what's coming forth. That is so true, yeah. Yeah, we have to listen carefully it's to the almost invisible, almost inaudible sounds. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure and honor and so wonderful to be with you through the miracles of cyberspace and technology. And uh, I so appreciate um, the invitation to visit and hope that I will make it there. <laughs> Lovely to see you again. Yes, thank you. Namaste. Thank you.